So described by one of my friends as the best, funniest, boppiest, most warm-hearted protest singer I've seen in ages. Yeah. Wow, yes. gosh. After performances at Woodford, Grace Petrie is currently touring Australia. We're here to discuss music and politics with Grace. Um, before getting underway, we'd like to acknowledge that this interview is recorded on Jagger and Tourable Country and that sovereignty was never ceded. So welcome to Australia. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, so what originally inspired you to pursue songwriting and how much do you see music as a vehicle for progressive politics? Gosh, wow, yeah. Well, I suppose I always wanted to be a musician long before I was in any way interested in politics, I suppose. Um, I mean, I started playing the guitar as a teenager and I just wanted to be a pop star, I suppose. <laughs> um, and I just, you know, I started writing kind of pop song, you know, those emulating the pop songs I was hearing on the radio. And I always knew that I was gay from, from quite a young age. And so when I was in my teens and I was writing, you know, heartbreak songs, I was writing heartbreak songs about girls, you know. And uh, it wasn't really until I started doing gigs when I was sort of 17, 18, that um, people kind of started speaking to me about that as though it was a political move, you know. And there was a, a lot of sort of discussion about, you know, um, discussing queer politics in that way on stage and that wasn't something that I was really even aware that I was doing and then um, so that was kind of a soft launch into it and then in 2010 when the Conservatives got into power in the UK um, you know I suppose the, the word is radicalized me you know I think it, it was quite good for radicalizing a lot of my generation you know I mean I grew up under a Labour government and you know, I have to say for my sins that I led a very sheltered life, you know, and, and it wasn't until the Tories got into power that I started to really keenly feel, particularly, I suppose, as a, as a, as a gay person and as a woman, I started to really feel the idea that, you know, oh, my rights aren't necessarily something I can take for granted here. You know, when Theresa May, before she was Prime Minister, she was made the Minister for Equalities, and throughout her career she's voted against um, queer legislation, um, queer positive legislation. And that was a real light bulb moment for me, you know, when I was in my early 20s and suddenly this person was in charge of my rights mm -hmm. as, a, as a gay person and it was somebody who demonstrably voted against the rights of people like me my entire life. And I suddenly thought, okay, yeah. I mean, I think there was a real sense under, under New Labour, which obviously had enormous faults, but there was a real sense, I think, in the 90s in Britain when I was growing up that you know, the major battles were over, you know, and we'd kind of won them. And then suddenly the 2010s came in and there was austerity and, you know, a real us versus them culture and, you know, the demonization of, you know, refugees and um, all of this cultural stuff, which has just gotten worse and worse and worse. So I suppose that's a very long, answer, long and rambling answer, but um, yeah, it was, it was accidental for sure. I mean, I've always written about things that have emotionally affected me and politics does you know I can't if I could stop being if the world would be a bit better I would stop being so angry <laughs> and I'd go back to writing pop songs I suppose. <laughs> yeah. which I'm um, actually uh, I think a lot of your songs reflect a lot of the things that you've just spoken about um, yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. that's where it comes out I suppose yeah. it always it always has been for me it's it's sort of like um uh, I don't know if you know the work of Martin Joseph, who's a wonderful um, sing-songwriter mm -hmm. from Wales, and uh, he always says the guitar is a cheap therapist for him. And I feel the same way, you know, it's, it's, it's what I'm thinking about, it's what I'm stewing over, it's what I'm angry about, you know, and that's where it comes out, really. And, and what, do you, what do you see as, like, the connection between so your politics um, that you express in music and like social movement struggles. Where do you see like music and culture and arts fitting into the social struggles? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question and it's one I think about a lot um, because, you know, at the end of the day, as much as we wish it, wa it wasn't so, I don't think, you know, songs can't really change the world that much. But, but I think, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously a massive fan of Billy Bragg and, and I think his, uh, his take on it has always been you know, songs can't change the world, but people can change the world, and songs can change people. And I think that's a really nice way of looking at it. And I think, you know, for me, I mean, the times that I sort of tried to use music or use the shows or use whatever platform I have in a kind of practical way, you know, I did a, a month of um, benefit shows for the mm -hmm. Labour Party in the 2019 election mm -hmm. campaign, and 
we went all over marginal seats trying to raise funds for the party and trying to do uh, membership drives and um, it was <laughs> resoundingly unsuccessful <laughs> in the election result and you know that you know that my ego took a real bruising there on top of obviously feeling absolutely devastated at the, the election result I was like wow you know I wonder how much worse we could have done if I hadn't bothered you know but I think um, I, I sort of came to realize after that that you know there's there's a lot of um, the, the big criticism that you face is where you're just preaching to the converted you know and how much can that really achieve and I think you know in the years that I've been doing this I think what I've sort of come around to conclude is you know the if you, if you pre preach the convert is one way of looking at it, but another way of looking at it is, you know, when you have a room full of people who all really believe in the same things, to hear, if you, you know, if you come from a place, or you come from a family, or you come from a town, where you're the only person who believes in these, these politics, or the, only, or the only queer person, or the only, you know, if you're rejected by your community, or whatever, if you can come to a room and hear everyone around you, wow, every, everyone is singing the same thing, everyone's singing that same chorus, I think the power of community, you know, to put to put gas back in your tank is is in, in, invaluable, you know. And, and I think that's the way that I've sort of started to looking at it, look at it now. Is like, you know, I, uh, no, I, I don't have any delusions of grandeur that I'm going to be sort of leading any any marches to to victory. But I think, you know, the the people that come to my shows, I'm I'm immensely immensely lucky with the audience that I have, and the people that come to my shows, you know, often they're just the most incredible activists and at any given at any given you know audience of mine there'll be you know people setting up charities you know housing refugees there'll be you know people you know working on suing the government you know like that, that's the kind of typical audience and you know I, I feel like when those people kind of come together and and come out of a, a night of hearing everybody singing the same thing it's just that little bit more confirmation that Oh no, I'm not on my own. There are more people who want things to change than the media want us to believe, yeah. and you know the system wants you to believe. Because at the end of the day, that's what keeps the system of capitalism, of patriarchy, in place is the idea that you know people almost forget to imagine a better world. You know, because we're so ground down all the time. And I think you know my shows can just for some for some people I like to believe they can just be that little glimmer of oh no, I think maybe. Maybe there are enough of us out there, you know? Yeah, yeah, building out people's morale and... Morale you know, boosting, yeah. absolutely, is what it's all about, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, nobody is... It's just that, it's just that thing, isn't it? It's like, yeah, I mean, I've lost every election. I've been a voting age in the UK. And, um, but it's that thing, isn't it, of like, you know, yeah, we might not win, but we definitely won't win if we don't try. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Your music does cover both the uphill climb um, and the difficulties of pushing for progressive change as well as the inspiration um, and the solidarity, the pride that's part of the struggle. What, what, would you say, what would you say are the things that give you hope? Gosh, I think like the, the people younger than me uh, give me immense hope. I think, you know, the, the climate activists that are coming up, you know, some of them obviously are so young and they have just this unbelievable burden on their shoulders but I but I do think that's inspiring this really sort of uncompromising urgency in them which I think is really inspiring to see you know and 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 I do believe you know I do believe that the old politics are dying you know and I think that I think that across the board you know like people under 30 do seem to really grasp the magnitude of the challenge we face in terms of the climate and in terms of just economic equality and um, you know necessity is the mother of invention isn't it and I think this system is it's broken it's been broken a long time but now I feel like it's really it's we're really experiencing its kind of death rattle at the moment and I really feel like those those younger people that are coming up you know 15 20 years behind me they're not messing around you know they're like no we, we have to change everything we have to do it like yesterday yeah. And that does give me a lot of hope, actually, you know. I think it must, you know, it's, it's terrifying in a lot of ways. You know, what we're up against is terrifying, what's at stake is terrifying. But I think, yeah, that, that, the fact that there's this whole generation that are like, it's, it's on us to ensure that there even is a world tomorrow. And they're just, you know, meeting that challenge, I think, incredibly. Just as, as far as queer politics goes, 
In Australia, I'd pretty much say that the, in the last couple of decades, there have been some really um, significant advances, especially um, like alongside the growth of uh, like the big campaign about marriage equality um, that you know took over a decade um, to to be victorious. Um, but in other parts of the world, it looks like things are going backwards. You could say you know the US, but other other places as well. There's been this growth of the this um, right wing that's particularly getting like latching onto this anti-trans, anti-queer rights um, agenda. Um, and, you know, we're seeing the same kind of things. People are trying to do the same kind of thing here in Australia as well. Um, so I'm just wondering how you see all of this, like either in the British context or globally. Mm. Well, um, yeah, I mean, in the, in, I can speak to the British context, mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, in, in depth because, you know, we've, I mean, we have, we've had, we have a, a huge problem with transphobia. It's become completely legitimized it's a mainstream position it's now it's definitely the position of the government um, and it's one that they're trying to implement in policy you know there's been some horrific things sort of tabled in in Britain around um, reporting teachers who respect trans people's pronouns and and um, identities and um, yeah I mean I, I think it's it's heart, it's heartbreaking to me because you know i don't know i just think to, to as a as a queer person to sort of be um subject to this rhetoric that we're kind of pitted against each other you know i think particularly as a butch lesbian there's a lot of discussion around um the erasure of butch lesbians for my you know for me it's just so frustrating to see the most homophobic <laughs> misogynist elements of British media and culture, you know, like the Rupert Murdoch press, who have, you know, materially contributed to the persecution of people like me my entire life, to now, when it's convenient for them to, to oppress trans people, to see them kind of standing up and going, we're just really worried about the butch lesbians. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, since when? Do you know what I mean? So that's just like really enraging. But I, but I also think, you know, in the wider beyond the community in the wider scale i think it is really terrifying to me to see you know as you say queer rights going backwards you know we obviously had that horrific hate crime in the us not very long ago i myself have definitely seen britain get more homophobic in line with transphobia becoming legitimized and i don't think those things are isolated at all and i just think you know it's always been the case throughout history <laughs> that as soon as we allow one Groups' rights to become debatable. It's a very short, it's a very short leap for the rest, for the rest of the community's rights to become debatable. So I think, you know, I, I think opposing transphobia and resisting transphobia is obviously the right thing to do on, uh, from a moral standpoint. But I also do think, you know, the the people who are oppressing trans folks, they're not going to stop there. They're the same people. They're the same misogynists. They're the same homophobes. They're the same, you know, patriarchy in action that have always been coming for us. And they're not going to stop with trans people. You know, when they're finished with trans people, they're going to move on to gay people, they're going to move on to bisexual people, they're going to move on to people of colour, they're going to move on to Muslims. They're going to, you, know, you know, and I think... So it's... To my... Somebody... Uh, I think it was Ruth Hunt, who was the previous uh, CEO of Stonewall in the UK, said, um, trans rights are the canary in the coal mine. And that really stayed with me. I think that's... And you can see it happening in Britain now, you know, this, this, it's been made into this culture war. You know, the level and the amount of media about trans people, particularly trans kids, you know, trans young people, that's so transphobic, that's so not science-led, that's so not expert-led, that's so fear-mongering. And it's just, it's pretty much daily now. It's pretty much daily. You just wouldn't believe how much it's, it's being made central to political life in Britain. And you're talking about such a small minority of the population that, that this relates to. So, you know, when you put it like that, it's like, oh, obviously this is a manufactured culture war in exactly the same way that they manufactured a culture war in the 80s with gay men and with AIDS, you know. So it's history repeating itself. And, and I feel like as, as with, you know, the AIDS crisis, it's exactly the same conditions for it. You've got a hugely unpopular conservative government who have completely starved public services who've underfunded everything to the point where the NHS is on its knees. You know, every public service is breaking at the seams. And in order to completely distract from their failings, they just have this 
They just have this boogeyman that they've basically invented. And it was gay people in the 80s, and it's trans people now. And I think we have to, we have a moral obligation to meet it with the same resistance that we did in the 80s. Mm. And look, just as a follow-up or a segue from that, I, I just can't help thinking about um, in Australia and the US, so I'm curious about, is it like this in the UK? Um, we often see the links between the, um, the groups that are hostile to trans rights and other queer rights are also the ones who are attacking abortion access. Absolutely, yeah. um, And in Australia, it's only been in this, it's only been in the 21st century that we've gotten out of the 19th century yeah. uh, with, with laws. I mean, it was only a few years ago that abortion got off the Crimes Act of so various yeah. states here. Um, but uh, and I know that in the UK, abortion access, I think it's been more liberalised for, for longer. Is there still, is there, is there scope for winding that back in the UK? I mean, there's like, definitely, there there's definitely um, the will on some, on some, from some actors to do so, yeah. And, as, and exactly as you say, it's that alliance of those same groups. You know, and, uh, you know, often, I mean, there's a, there's a, I'm loath even to say their name, but there's a, an organisation in the, in the UK called the LGB Alliance, who are just a transphobic hate group. Um, and obviously it's um, deceptive because you hear a name like the LGB Alliance, you go, oh yeah, they sound like, they sound cool. Yeah, I've got no problem with LGB people. Yeah, I'll give them a meeting space. I'll give them a meeting room. I'll give them an interview on the TV. And what they are is a transphobic hate group. That's what they are. And um, it just recently came out, you know, that their headquarters are literally in the same building as some of the most far right pro-Brexit organisations in the UK, some pro-Brexit think tanks, you know, I'm talking about serious climate science denial, you know, you name it, like, and you follow the money back and it's all the same, it's all the same people. Um, so, it, yeah, that does worry me a huge thing, you know, I think it's all part of the same, you know, these things all stem from the same place, it all comes back to the same place, as it, as it has done in the US, you know, you know, the, the most prominent transphobic organisations and voices are absolutely in bed with, you know, anti-abortion um, agendas all the way back. That's where the money is. That's what that's what the end game is, and I, and it's so so unbelievably enraging to me that some of our most prominent feminists, and they are feminists, you know, they're feminists and they're in bed with this and they can't even see it. And I'm just going, where do you think this is going to lead? What do you honestly think is the end game of all this? Do you think they're going to go, yeah, we're finished with trans people now? Absolutely not, you know. Yeah. So now, um, a few years ago, your song "Whatever's Left" uh, seemed to describe a pretty bleak scene on the on the British left. Um, I didn't know I was born. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And, and then things since... haven't got better from there. I'll tell you. <laughs> there you yeah. Go. Um, I was going to say since then we've had the you know the inspiring years of the Corbyn leadership of the yeah. the Labour Party, yeah. uh, and then this shit show that's going on now. Mm. Um, yeah. And the Keir Starmer leadership of the Labour Party that totally wants to um, decimate the left yeah. of Labour. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think about this process? I think that it is morally bankrupt. But further than that, I think it's short-sighted and bad strategy. It's not going to win. You know, we came the clo Labour came the closest to winning, um, you know, since they were in power in 2017 under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. And I think that surprised the entrenched establishment in politics and media in the UK. And they really thought, oh, wow, you know, we've got to throw everything at this guy next time. And they really did. Um, and I'm not going to say that there weren't some mistakes under Corbyn's leadership, but I think ultimately, you know, there was half a million people in the party at the height of his leadership, um, which is more than there ever were under Tony Blair. And, you know, I was a part of that movement. I was campaigning alongside those people. I was a member at that time. I'm not anymore. Um, and I saw with my own eyes, you know, it was, it was a lot of young people, it was a lot of people who'd never campaigned or door knocked before in their lives. It was a real injection of hope and enthusiasm. And again, that idea that things can be better, you know, that was what, that was what Labour between 2015 and 2019 represented, I think, was the idea that, well, things, you know, it's, the, the old script was thrown out. And the old script was, well, you've got Tories or you've got Labour who were just ever so slightly less bad, you know. And everybody was sick of that and that wasn't working for anybody you know, apart from a very small and very privileged and very rich group of people in Britain. And um, 
And now it makes me very sad to see Kisama determined, as you say, to um, you know rout the left from the party, which I just think is bad strategy and is you know fundamentally a betrayal of the policy of the um, platform he was elected on, which was you know he specifically stood as the unity candidate. You know he said I'm going to unite both wings of the party. Um, and this has been going on my entire life, you know, like you have the left of labor, you have the, you know, the right of labor, or the center of labor kind of um, fighting over the steering wheel. And as long as we have first past the post in Britain, you know, we're at a mass massive disadvantage. Um, so I think to just go back to the old tactics that lost in 2010 and lost in 2015 is absolute insanity to me. Um, so I think it's I think it's going to fail, <laughs> apart from anything else. Um, and I also just think it's you know the challenges that we are facing globally, environmentally, economically in Britain. You know, late stage capitalism doesn't have the answers to it. You know, and I think when I see Keir Starmer basically trying to outflank the Tories on on immigration and on king and country, I just think you know it's. You know, your old road is rapidly aging, you know, and, and uh, it's not going to work. I feel, I feel certain that it's not going to work. I think that I think we need radical sea change in Britain. I don't think he's the person to deliver it. Um, so we'll see. I mean, you know, as I said to you, I mean, as we're speaking now, Britain is absolutely wrecked with public sector strikes uh, which have been going on um, for months. There's been rail strikes and poster strikes and now the Royal College of Nursing has uh, ordered strike action for the first time in their 106 year history which is a response to you know just appalling failing standards across the healthcare system. I think I saw a headline that said something like 500 people are dying unnecessarily every week due to A&E waiting times. And these, th you know, this is a country on its knees. It's it's at breaking point in so many ways. It's at breaking point. So I'd be interested. It's you know, I don't say that with any. It doesn't give me pleasure to say that, but I do. You know, I do think when something's got to give, it will. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the, over the next couple of years. I mean, COVID exposed a lot of holes in the fabric of British society. You know, things that uh, you know. Maybe we hadn't really realized they'd been cut as deeply as they had by austerity. And you only really find that out when something really goes wrong and you, you realize there is no safety net. A lot of people found that out. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens over the next few years. Yeah, I, I, but Starmer ain't it. <laughs> back, to your, um, back to your music and your tour. So what's next for your tour? Where can people see you play? What albums are you promoting? And, and how can you fans connect with your music? Well, thank you for asking. Um, so we're on tour um, all across Australia. Well, all across it, we're down the, coming down the East Coast and Adelaide and Tasmania. So we're in Brisbane tonight and then in the Gold Coast tomorrow. Then we go down to Sydney, Katoomba, Canberra, over to Adelaide, down to Tassie. We're doing Signet Festival. And then we've got a couple of shows in um, Franklin and Hobart. And then we're back up to Melbourne and Geelong, finishing up in Illawarra Folk Festival. So lots of chances to see us. And then we are actually back in Australia in March. Uh, so we're doing Port Ferry. Folk Festival and uh, the Blue Mountains Folk Festival and trying to fit in a few other shows around that um, to be announced. Um, and at the moment we're, so I've got a record called Connectivity which was largely written during lockdown and recorded um, in 2021 and uh, it's a collection of songs about that very strange time, you know, and about that strange moment that the entire world was united in you know, one common experience for the first time, I suppose, since the Second World War and um, and the strange sort of juxtaposition of, you know, us all being united in one experience, but that experience being total isolation was a real strange thing. So, but, you know, I was at home and I couldn't gig and I couldn't tour and I just wrote a load of songs and, um, and uh, that's the record connectivity and it's all about the ways that ultimately all we've got is each other. I think that's the thing, and that you know that's the thread that comes back through all of the political conversations and all of the ideologies and positions that we talk about is the idea that you know ultimately, you know we're we're one community, aren't we, across the world? All we've got is each other, and I think nothing is nothing's exposed that as as extremely as the last couple of years. You know, because I know I don't know about Australia, but when in the scariest point 
of COVID in those first few weeks when we just didn't know what the hell was going on. You know, I know who it was that kept us going and it wasn't bankers or politicians, you know. It was street sweepers and nurses and, um, you know, the people stacking our shelves in our supermarkets. They were the people that we really realized, oh, you're the ones we can't live without, you know. Why didn't we realize that before? Absolutely, absolutely. And just um, to circle back to how people can connect with you. Sure. So I'm on all social media um, and it's just uh, it's Grace Peach on Twitter, Grace Peach Music on Instagram, uh, Grace Peach Music on TikTok. I think I'm still figuring out TikTok. Um, uh, I think I'm a bit old to be there. Um, and loads of stuff on my website and stuff. If you just Google my name, then, yeah, you can't miss me. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, as I said before, very much looking forward to the gig tonight. Thank you and, so um, much. Thanks for talking. To thanks us. for talking to me. Thank you. It's really interesting. Cheers.